Well, as you know, we're working our way through the book of Acts, and now we're at this point when they're needing to select some people to look after the daily distribution of food. But before we get into that, I want to talk a little bit about what the early church would have looked like in these early stages. Most of the people in the early church at this point would have been Jewish, con- Jewish people. They would have been converts to Christianity out of Judaism. But within that group, there would have actually been two other parties, or they would have been divided into two groups of their own. There would have been the Palestinian Jews, those who are the ones who grew up in Israel from birth, had lived there all of their life. They would have mainly spoke Aramaic, but they would have also known Greek. It was the lingua franca of the day. Everyone basically knew a little bit of Greek, especially for trade. But these were the ones who had been born and bred in Israel. That's who they were, the Palestinian Jews. But there were also another group of Jews from what's called the Diaspora, the Dispersion. And these were the Greek-speaking Jews. And they came from a period in history way back about the 6th century BC when Babylon came in and conquered Israel and seized Jerusalem. And what they did when they did that was they transplanted or uprooted large sections of the Jewish community and moved them all the way over to Babylon and settled them there. And over time, these people began to spread. Some of them, we know under Nehemiah and Ezra, returned back to Israel and were involved in the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem itself, and those were the descendants of the, um, or the ancestors of the Palestinian Jews. But the others spread all throughout the Mediterranean basin. They went to all the places. They went to Greece, Rome, Spain, everywhere. They spread around Turkey and so on. And instead of returning home, and that's when they established communities in those places, they built their synagogues, and that was their home. And they were mainly as you would have to do, learn the language of the area into which you settled. They were Greek-speaking Jews. Now, of course, at the religious festivals like Pentecost, large numbers of them would come back to Jerusalem every year to celebrate the festival of Pentecost, the Feast of Weeks, and so on. And when Pentecost happened from the Christian perspective, when there was that huge outpouring of the Holy Spirit and large numbers of people came to faith, some of these guys chose to remain in Jerusalem and settle there. Maybe they already had property there, but for whatever reason, some of them stayed behind. And so we ended up with a church that was made up of both Palestinian and Greek-speaking Jews. Now, the Palestinian Jews who spoke Aramaic, they kind of thought of themselves as the more pure variety. You know, They were born and bred in the land. And so they looked down a little bit upon the Greek-speaking Jews. There was a bit of a prejudice against those who came from away. They weren't quite seen as pure, you know, they, they didn't speak Aramaic, most of them, you know, they only spoke Greek. Uh, so there was a little bit of a, a prejudice against them. And we have a problem that arose in the early church with the distribution of food. Another interesting fact is that, uh, as is today, um, most women outlive their men and the guys die off early. It's a sad fact for us guys. Um, and, the, and the widows carry on. But for the Jewish widows, for a lot of them who were born outside of Israel, who lived outside of Israel, they liked to spend their last days in Israel. So when it was just them, the kids had all grown up and gone off and their husband had died, a lot of them actually moved back to Israel and settled in Israel in Jerusalem. And so there were a lot of Greek-speaking widows in Jerusalem as well. And the situation arose that within the church itself, the Greek-speaking widows were being neglected in the daily distribution of food. Now, we don't actually know why it was happening. It could have been simply because the apostles were overworked. Or it could have been because there was a this centuries-old bit of prejudice against the Greek-speaking Jews. And maybe that was colouring a little bit what was happening in the distribution of food to those who were in need. So that's a bit of, bit of the background as to what the church was like at that point. But you know, nothing in human affairs is ever perfect, is it? Nothing. Even the early church, which started off so well and was growing in leaps and bounds, had its own issues. We only heard a couple of weeks ago about the deception of Ananias and Sapphira, who wanted to look good in the eyes of the congregation. And so they lied about some property that they'd sold in order to achieve that, and they suffered dearly because of it. And now we have some more human frailty coming through. Strongly held prejudice about Greek-speaking Jews and the Twelve Apostles being overloaded in the fast-growing church led to a problem in the distribution of food that needed to be sorted out. And what I think is important to note from this passage is not that problems arose, because we're human beings, aren't we? 
Problems will always arise whenever people are involved. You've probably heard the saying that if you find the perfect church, don't join it. You know, because we're, we're human. It's just a fact of life. What's important is not that problems arise, because they always will, but how do you deal with them? What do you do when a difficult situation arises? How do you face up to an issue that comes to light? How do you deal with your problems? And this passage offers us some clues about both what we should and shouldn't do when conflict arises. And the first thing I want to take note of is that we should not murmur behind closed doors. When it starts off by saying there was a problem, I'll read that verse again. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Grecian Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. The Greek word for to complain there is a word gongusmus, and it actually means to secretly grumble and not own up to it. To secretly grumble and not own up to it. In other words, to complain behind closed doors. You know, it's one thing to raise an issue privately, but it's another to grumble about something without any intention of dealing with it. If you have no intention when mentioning an issue that reflects badly on another person of sorting the problem out, maybe through seeking their advice on how to deal with it, then in the end, it just becomes gossip, doesn't it? Then you shouldn't do it. The thing that makes us different as Christians from the rest of the world, or should make us different, is that we're willing to take, you know, follow the hard road. We're willing to face into problems that come our way. If we make a mistake, we should be willing to go to the person we made the mistake to and say, I'm sorry, I blew it, I made a mistake. You know, Christians, it's about integrity, it's about honesty, it's about maintaining good relationships with each other. And if we make mistakes or if there are complaints or issues arising in the body of Christ, we shouldn't just go and whisper about it behind closed doors. We should face up to it honestly and deal with it. It's one of the things that makes us different from a lot of other people. Now I understand the need to vent when you've been hurt, to be able to express your feelings, legitimate feelings about maybe how you've been disadvantaged. But if that's all you're doing, if that's all you do, then you're not doing enough. Because what happens when people vent or share something with someone else is the person that you share it with then ends up with a bad impression of the person you're talking about. And quite probably it's a wrong one as well because it's all about perspective and there's always two sides to a story. And more often than not, the first pre-impression that you get is often wrong. And then if that person that you shared it with goes on to share it with someone else, and worse, if as in Chinese whispers the story starts to get modified along the way, then what you really have is gossip. The delicious pleasure of talking about another person behind their back. Of taking them down a notch or two so that you can feel better about yourself. Because at its heart, that's what gossip is all about. People get pleasure about having secret knowledge. You know, about knowing something that no one else knows. Because it makes them feel powerful. It makes them feel in control. I know something that no one else knows. There's a, it makes me a bit more special. But you know, it's only so special so far. It gets even better when other people know that I know something that they don't know. So there's this insidious desire of wanting to share what you know with other people as well. The sad thing, of course, is that it's at its heart, the pleasure derived from gossip relies on the one sharing it actually having very low self-esteem, a very poor sense of self-image, where the chance to pull someone else down perversely makes them feel better about themselves. It means that the one gossiping doesn't see people is how Christ sees them, as beloved children, all equally loved and valued for who they are, not what they do. The gossip feels better about themselves when they pull someone down, because their way of valuing themselves depends on some very sad form of pecking order, where your ranking or sense of importance in life depends on pulling others down ahead of you and then trying to maintain a life of your own that can't be criticised so that you can keep your position on the ladder. And you know what the sad thing about this is? It's because according to the Gospel, there is no ladder. 
There is no ladder in God's eyes. God doesn't have a ranking system when he looks at us. God sees each of us equally as his children. It's the same with the way parents should be. You know, every one of our children is a gift from God to us, and we love them all, or should love them all, equally for just who they are, not what they do, not for how tidy they keep their room or how well they do at school or anything like that. We love our kids because, in a sense, they're an expression of ourselves. We love them simply for who they are. And that's how God loves us as well. And yet for the gossip, that's not how it is. They put value in human beings on something other than just that pure intrinsic sense of that we are made in the image of God. Instead, they put value on human life and human humanity on the basis of what they can do or achieve. And this is the ranking system, this ladder that we sit on. And, we just, and if we want to kind of like move up that ladder a little bit, we've either got to pull other people down or clamour over them to get above them. It's so sad. And what's more, Jesus says very clearly that we have to be careful how we judge others, how we look at others, because you will be judged in the same way. The same way. If you're guilty of gossip, if you're guilty of sharing damaging or personal information about another person with no intention of seeking their good, then watch out. Watch out on Judgment Day. But even more, watch out today. Because I think the gossip leads a very sad and lonely life. Where people become very careful around them about what they say. And they certainly never ever trust them. If there's anyone here today who maybe struggles with gossip, then I would say to you today, don't leave here this morning without committing yourself to doing something about it to rethinking how it is that you see people and see yourself. Thinking about how God sees you truly for who you are. Thankfully, even though the grumbling in the early church was behind closed, closed doors, for many, it obviously wasn't that way for all. Or possibly even the Holy Spirit spoke a word of knowledge to the apostles. But either way, the situation comes to the attention of the apostles and they take steps to deal with it and they do so incredibly well number one they don't muck around what's the first thing the apostles do they get everyone together they get all of the disciples together and that avoids the issue of information being passed on second hand someone who wasn't present at the meeting hearing second hand about what was going on Everyone is in the same room. Everyone hears the same message. And then they confront the problem honestly. And they own it. Yes, we are too busy. We're overloaded. The church has grown a lot quicker than what we thought. And while we had the initially, initial phases, we thought we could handle everything. We obviously can't. But what are our priorities, said the apostles? What has God called us to do first? We're to be teachers of the faith. And we need, therefore, because of that, to delegate, and we need to delegate wisely. Not just to pick the first person who walks in the door, but to choose people even for the task of administering the distribution of food who are full of the Spirit. Full of the Spirit and wisdom. This was an administration task. And even though the people they're picking are probably leaders within the church, it is simply an administration task. Yet even for this task, they are looking for people who are full of the Spirit. Every task, every role, every ministry position within the church, we should be looking for people to fill that role who are full of the Spirit and wisdom. The implication, of course, is that if we're looking for people who are full of the Spirit, that there are some who are not full of the Spirit. Every Christian has the Holy Spirit. It's our seal of ownership in Christ of who we belong to. But not every Christian is full of the Spirit. Are you full of the Spirit? Does God have his way fully in you? And by the names of those chosen, it looks like they even chose seven who were from the Greek-speaking part of the church, from the disaffected group. Now that's bravery, isn't it? The group that's complaining you pick the seven people who are going to deal with the issue from out of that group. That's wisdom to me as well. And it demonstrates huge trust. 
Furthermore, they didn't just pick seven of the Greek-speaking Jews. One of them was actually a convert to Judaism. He was a Gentile who had come to faith, converted to Judaism, found the Messiah. So they picked someone, you know, for the Jews, they looked down on the Greek-speaking Jews, the Palestinians, but they looked even further down on the Gentiles. And even though a proselyte was a step up in their eyes, it was still someone from outside, you know, beyond the pale a little bit. And to pick one of those as one of the seven to be a leader in the church dealing with this issue shows incredible wisdom and trust, it seems to me, on the part of the apostles. And what's more, they allowed the church, the disciples, to pray and to choose those seven. They said, look, this is what we should do. We should pick seven, <coughs> we should pick seven men. Now you go away and do it. You go away and pick those seven men. And they came back with those seven names. And then they publicly, as apostles, supported that choice by praying for the seven and laying hands on them. And when you lay hands on someone in the, in the, in the Bible, it's not so much to give an impartation of the Holy Spirit, but that is sometimes what it's about, because these guys were already full of the Holy Spirit. It would have been to confer apostolic authority upon them for the task to which they've been chosen. So it was a public acknowledgement that these guys were being given authority uh, in a sense under the apostles to do that task. It's very interesting actually as I was reading this realise that this is exactly what happens in the ordination services for priests and deacons within the church. Uh, we gather as the body of Christ and at a point in the service the, the candidate is brought up the front and all the other priests come and lay hands on them and there is a praying for the person and then there is an asking for the Holy Spirit to come and fill them just like what happened here. And the result of this process that the apostles worked through was that the whole assembly were happy with the decision, they were happy with it, and then with the matter settled, the church continued to grow in numbers and influence as even members of the priesthood started to come to faith. Members of the Jewish temple priesthood started to come to faith as well. And it's because they dealt with the issue well. If they dealt with it poorly, we might have actually seen the church start to struggle and maybe go into decline. But because they dealt with it well and continued to build that unity, God's blessing continued to pour out on the church, and it did well. So whenever you face conflict, you and I, be it in the church, at home, at work, in your personal life, whatever, Take this model that the apostles put forward here and use it because it's incredibly good. Involve all affected parties. <coughs> Name the issue up front. Own your part in it. If you've blown it in some way, own it. Consult as many as possible and get their feedback on possible decisions. Give them shared ownership of the solution by getting their input. Put the decision into practice and publicly support it. And if you do that, everyone wins.